Well, welcome out to Trail. I'm so blessed to have you guys here this morning with us. If you're new, stick around, ask questions. There is a unfortunate one o'clock showing today, but that just builds our faith, guys. That builds our faith. We are, we are praying down the walls, right? We are praying down victory upon this church, you know? I don't, I, challenge accepted, let's move forward. But I got, a, I got a message this morning everyone needs to hear. This is, I'm preaching to myself this morning, but you know, I, I say it with meaning and, and I really do mean it. God's in a good mood. I feel like we, we are living in a, in a state right now of harvest and we are ready to reap something great. And it's just a matter of recognizing, you know what? We, we have expectation of the goodness of God and everything that we put our hand to and what we are doing to do, what we are doing. Uh, I, I, again, I feel like we're, we have this mentality where like we're trying to climb out of a, of a hole, you know? Man, we are out of that hole. We're on top of a mountain. You know, we are moving and God's good. He's so good. And that's what I want to point us to this morning. You know, um, there, there's so much good wealth of knowledge in Matthew chapter 13. So I want you to turn your Bible there. But Matthew chapter 13, verse 44, we're going to talk about a parable this morning that traditionally speaking, has been misinterpreted for years and I want to break that down for you because um, it's not something you could just read through. It's the only parable that's one, uh, it's one of the only ones that's, that's one scripture. But this parable is so, so good. But if we break it down, we recognize who we are. And it's, oh, it's so good. So Matthew chapter 13, verse 44. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure that a man discovered hidden in a field. And in his excitement, he hid it again and sold everything he owned to get enough money to buy the field. In this parable, traditionally speaking, it's been thought that the treasure is the kingdom of heaven. And we are to give away everything that we have because we found the the treasure, we found the kingdom of heaven, and we would do anything for that. But that's actually traditionally wrong. It's been taught wrong. Because if you break it down better, that's deeper, and there's, there's more of a, an understanding of each word that's being used. Because, let me just debunk that really quickly. The kingdom of heaven cannot be found. You cannot hide it, nor can you buy it. Okay? So with that theory of looking at it and thinking that the kingdom of heaven is the treasure, and we have found that, we're, we're wrong. Because again, you can't find it. You can't buy it. Okay. You can't hide it. And none of those are, it's not possible, but breaking it down, you'll see that, uh, the treasure hidden in the field is actually us, us, the church, you and me, we are the treasure. That field is the world. And that man who has found that treasure is Jesus. He is joyous when he finds that treasure. He takes that treasure And he's so excited and he puts it right back into the field, the world, all right? And he pays everything, the ultimate price, he pays everything he has. He gives it all for that field. He has died on the cross for us so that we can live. We are that treasure. And when we begin to operate from that position of knowing who we are as that treasure, it is a position that you're always going to want to find yourself in. God actually, in Exodus 19 and Psalm 135, he calls Israel his special treasure. That's us. We are his special treasure. You know, when we see that, the, that Jesus in this parable finding, physically finding the treasure, he puts us back in the world. Why? Because he wants the world to know the treasure. He wants us to go out and bring more people into the knowing of that treasure, of the power that's, that we have and that authority. We've been marked that we are children of God and that when people recognize that they are children of God, it's like an atmospheric change. You start believing and recognizing and operating in a way that's totally unique in comparison to the world. And and, and that's what Jesus is so excited about. He sees, oh, I see who you were intended to be. But there was a price that needed to be paid. And Jesus paid that price. I love John chapter 17, verse 11. 
He says, Jesus, now I am departing from the world. They are staying in this world, talking about us. But I'm coming to you, Holy Father. You have given me your name. Now protect them by the power of your name so that they will be united just as we are. When you recognize your treasure. Now, the problem is, don't, don't take my words wrong when I say this. By no means am I, am I a heretic. I'm not saying this. I'm not bringing Jesus to our level. I'm bringing us to Jesus's level. When you start recognizing your value, your treasure, when you start looking in the, uh, through the eyes okay, of, of our Father in heaven, when you see this, can, you can do that because you see his character, the truth of this word. When you start doing that, you'll recognize that, that God sees you as he saw Jesus. Because why? Because Jesus paid the ultimate price for you and covered you in the blood of Jesus. He covered you. He covered all your sins. And so God looks at you white as snow. He looks upon you with favor. He looks upon you with, with an attitude of, I love you. I want to see you thrive. I want to see you be all you've been called to be, what I intended. When you see that and recognize that Jeremiah's words come right off the page, that he knew you even in your mother's womb. Before that, when you recognize those passages and you put it into perspective of what Jesus Christ did and you're a treasure, you start operating a little differently. You stop beating yourself up. You stop sitting there beating other people up. You're sitting there at your workplace in those circumstances and situations that come so, I mean, they come on you like a tidal wave at times. And you feel overwhelmed and you feel suffocated and you're, you're dying. You feel the death. But when you recognize the treasure that you are, you can speak the name above all names, the name of Jesus. And that worship mentality comes in the room. Nothing can harm you. Nothing can harm you. It is a great position to find yourself in. We're set apart, sanctified by God's truth. And when you recognize it, it changes everything. Yes, you may be in this world, okay? But you're not of this world any longer. You start operating differently. You recognize God's sovereignty. You recognize that there is heaven here on earth. You recognize the power and the authority that's been given to you. We're, you know, it, everyone could look at this and read this all differently. My church is kind of a big deal. You can look at that and be like, whoa, look at this church. They think they're something. Wow. That's not what we're saying. That's the problem. Everyone has this attitude of walking on, whoa, you better, get, you better humble yourself. We are very humble. But we're prideful in the fact that Jesus died on the cross for us so that we can live, and we want other people to know it. So our church is kind of a big deal because we have the best news on the planet and everyone needs to know it. We don't need to be ashamed of it. We have this mentality of, of oh, I don't want to say anything. What if they think of me as a weirdo? You are a weirdo already, and you know it. <laughs> We're all weird. I love it. My a good friend of mine, he was a college, um, he's one of my college students when I was a college pastor at Marshall University, and he now travels with a, um, an evangelist, a, a, a big evangelist, and so he gets in all kinds of meeting rooms with all sorts of famous people that are pastors. And I say famous, I hate saying it like that, but you know what I mean. And so I, I said, hey, what's it like being around this person? What's it like being around that person? Because I'm curious, because, you know, they're countenance of who they are, you know? I'm excited, because I like hearing these ministers speak, and I love their words, and, the, you know, the, God, the revelation that God's been giving them. So I'm like, what are they like? What? And he's like, they're all weird. And I was like, all right. <laughs> like, I don't want them to be weird because I want to bring myself up, but I love the fact that we're all weird. It's okay. It's all right. But God makes the, he comes and fills the gaps of those moments. But the insecurities that the enemy tries to point out to us, it binds us. And we think, oh, not me, not now, not never. God says, no, come on, I love you. You know the name above all names. 
Come on, operate in that. Know your identity, who you are in Christ. In John chapter 17, in verses 13 through 19, he goes on, Jesus says, Now I'm coming to you. I told them many things while I was with them in this world so they would be filled with my joy. How many of you guys are filled with joy 24-7? I know, right? (laughs) But Jesus gives us a mandate. He says that, so they would be filled with my joy. You remember Jesus, last week I talked about it, Jesus walked into the Pharisees' houses and and in, in locations where the joy would be sucked out of the room and Jesus still walked out smiling. Right? He had joy. Joy unspeakable and full of glory. Am I the only Pentecostal with the white hymnals? I'm the only one? It's a great song. I love that one. That was my favorite. Clearly you guys had the blue ones. Anyway. Verse 14, I have given them your word and the world hates them because they do not belong to the world just as I do not belong to the world. I'm not asking you to take them out of the world but to keep them safe from the evil one. They do not belong to this world any more than I do. Make them holy by your truth. Teach them your word, which is truth. Just as you sent me into the world, I'm sending them into the world. And I give myself as a holy sacrifice for them so they can be made holy by your truth. Man. So what I'm saying and what what Jesus is saying is that God sees you the same way he sees Jesus. I mean, that's heavy. That's awesome. That's that's a mandate that you need to wake up to and go, okay. God's looking down upon me the same way he sees Jesus. Well, I, I better operate in that authority. I better operate in that way because there's a standard here that's been set. I need to do this. Now, I, I got to tell you, sometimes we feel inadequate. We feel we, don't ha- we, we can't do it all that Jesus did. That's why he sent the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a, in John chapter 1, verse 32. The Holy Spirit came down like a dove, right? It rests upon you. I love what, what Bill Johnson from Bethel, how he puts it. He says, you know, if in that, in that uh, uh, example of the Holy Spirit as a dove, imagine the dove landing on your shoulder. How would you begin to, how would you begin to walk and operate? Well, you, very carefully, right? Because why you don't want to spook the you don't want to spook the dove, right? You don't want the dove to fly away. You you, you would walk in a way of of what of consideration of the dove. That's, good. That's how you would do it. You wouldn't make a step without thinking. If I go over here, will that the Holy Spirit stay? The whole, am I is it pleasing? Is it going to spook the Holy Spirit? You would constantly be thinking this way. And so that comforter, the Holy Spirit, comes in and the Holy Spirit guides you. The Holy Spirit convicts you, convicts you in a positive way, not to condemn you, but to give you life, life in abundance. In those moments you, you mess up, the Holy Spirit speaks to you and says, hey, that's not the way. And you go, I know. Ah, oh, Jesus. And the Holy Spirit, man, oh, you just feel that presence, that love, that warmth. Oh, man. It's such a good place to find yourself in. You know, Jesus is bringing God's way of doing things to, in heaven to earth. That was the whole point. So now we get to operate heavenly. We get to operate in a different way. We've got to start operating this way. It's important. Let me point out something here. I think this is, this is really key for me. In, in Acts chapter 2, you see the Holy Spirit came upon the upper room, just like it was foretold, you know. John the Baptist in John chapter 1 was declaring, you know, I may baptize you and by water, but Jesus, you know, he's coming to baptize you, you know, in the Holy Spirit, right? It's going to be this awesome experience and, and, and not just an experience, but a life living forever experience. And, and so Jesus, even when he was telling the disciples of the foretelling of what's about to happen and all that was going to take place, and then he says, don't do anything until you have the Holy Spirit. Don't do anything. 
So sure enough, the Holy Spirit comes, and then we see in Acts chapter 5 that there were signs, miracles, and wonders taking place, and Peter's shadow, Peter's shadow, they were taking people and lining them in the streets and just hopes of Peter's shadow falling upon them to heal them. And it says in that, in that chapter, in chapter 5, that and all were healed. Because we should not, a church, church is not a place where, God never intended church to be a place where we just talked about miracles. I mean, I, I know some of us, we think, oh, yeah, it is. That's just, that, that's what we're going to do. We're just going to come in, sit down, get comfortable. You, you tell us something, then we'll go. No, mm-mm. You've actually placed it upon me and me alone as your pastor of he's the guy. He's the guy. Huh? Mm-mm. We are. We're the church. We're the treasure. Every one of us. OK, that standard you've put on me. Well, guess what? I put it back on you. <laughs> right. I saw that pastor walk down the street. I saw how he was walking. I look how you're walking, too. I see, I, he shouldn't be over there. You shouldn't be either. Then we get this idea of like putting pastors on these pedestals. What I start off with, we're all weirdos. Every one of us. We all got quirks and weird things and whatever. Guys, you yourself, you've got to realize there's a mandate upon your life. Because why? Because God's looking at you like he sees Jesus. Oh, I love it. I, I, I'm going to come back to, to Peter in just a second with the shadow. But I go to, to Daniel chapter 6. In Daniel chapter 6, you'll see that Daniel, and I use my, you listen to the scriptures, he said that Daniel distinguished himself among those people around him. Just he distinguished himself. Some people think, they, they, everyone right here, you think, Jesus distinguishes us. God distinguishes us. In the Old Testament, all these great prophets and, and, and all these men and women, all of them, Jesus, you know, God distinguished them. Daniel's, Daniel's book says that, and he himself distinguished himself and people took notice. Do you know why? Because he always sought counsel with God. He always found himself, he even got in trouble for doing it. They tried to snare him into a trap, okay, of, of trying to see, well, well, will he worship the king? He'll worship the king, not that king. And so what did he do? He worshiped God. He still every day, every day opened up his window, right? And, and worshiped God. Nobody was going to tell him otherwise. No, nothing was going to distract him from what was important. Because we have so much distracting us from what's important. When you begin to distinguish yourself, the only way you're going to distinguish yourself is going to the Father. Because why? Because His ways are higher than your ways. That's the distinguishing factor. Even in James, when James says, Elijah was a man just like us. He was obedient. That's what set him apart from most of us in this room. He was obedient. Elijah learned to distinguish himself amongst men and, and women by how? By spending time with God. Peter's shadow healed people. Why? Because your shadow is a reflection of what's overshadowing you. What are you allowing to overshadow you? I hope it's God. What are you placing above you? Whatever that is, that's overshadowing. That's what people take notice of. Whoa, where's this coming from? Some of us get caught up in so much stuff. We get caught up in the world's ways of doing stuff. We say, I gotta do it this way. I gotta do it, I gotta do it that way. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 21, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where is your treasure? Where is your treasure? Because there's your heart. 
What are you placing your heart into? I said it last week and I still, I still mean it. I want, I want to see this take place. I want us to start recognizing the importance of church, the importance of community, the importance of our brothers and sisters in Christ that we build each other up, that we don't look at this as just a social event or a place that you just feel like you need to go to to get the, your checklist of the, you know, the sticker for your chore chart. I did it. Thank God. Whew, hopefully I'll get in heaven. If we treat church like it's a big deal, and it's a spiritual growth opportunity where we can have revelation, where we can find solitude in who we are, our identity, so that we can walk in a way that's unique and different. You guys have been given promises. Start operating in these principles and promises. God's so good. He's so good. Ah, oh, I could go on forever and I got to stop. And Jesus, I'm speaking in my mountain. Jesus' name. You guys want to get, say all you want, but I'm going to tell you right now, I am chipping away at that mountain. In Jesus' name, that warehouse is finished and completed so we can get out. And I know you guys, my wife's like, stop harping on the fact there's a theater movie afterwards. What's well, annoying? <laughs> and I want to worship more. Oh, man, our God is worthy of worship. Oh, I love it, man. You guys, we, we need to recognize who we are our God's given us promises. He's given us revelation and knowledge. And it's a matter of us distinguishing ourselves by going to his thoughts, which are higher than our thoughts, finding out what he has to say about things. My father, years ago, my freshman year of college, he didn't want me to get a job. He said, I don't want you your freshman year of college to get a job. I, I, wanna, I want you to focus on your schoolwork and, and, and understand how college works. And I said, all right. He said, so I'm going to give you $20 a week. That takes care of your gas and the extra expenses or whatever. Remember, gas was 89 cents a gallon back then. That was awesome. Road trips all the time. But I went home at the end of my spring semester. I, this was before you had a check card. All you had were checks, and I would write cash. And, and, and take it to a bank and they'd cash it out for me. I never once went to the bank, my personal bank, and asked them how much was in my bank account. But I remember that spring semester, it ended and I drive home and I'm so excited. And I thought, oh, I got to get my $20 out. So I go to the bank and I said, hey, I went up to the teller in my car and I said, oh, I want to get 20 bucks or I'm writing cash on the check, $20, getting ready to sign it. And then I stop and I go, hey, how much is in my bank account? And she told me, it was like thousands of dollars. And I go, what? Thousands of dollars? And that alarmed her because she's like, how would you not know what's in your account? She goes, sir, I'm going to need some proof of identification. I go, that's okay. <laughs> Pulled out my license, Joshua H. Gresham, showed it to her. And she's like, you're Joshua H. Gresham. That's right, I am. Give me that money. I remember writing out that check, thousand dollars, you know, I'm like, I'm taking it all out. <laughs> she thought I was crazy. I remember going to my dad immediately, dad, you told me I had $20 a week and there was thousands of dollars in that bank account. He said, well, yeah. He goes, I just throw money in there. Sometimes 40 bucks, sometimes 30 bucks. I just kind of cut off every time I got a paycheck, I'd see the difference of, the, of what it was, and I just put that in your bank account. He goes, that was your dumb fault thinking you only had $20. <laughs> he said, how much did you take out? And I said, all of it. <laughs> and my dad just giggled. I go, all right, it's your money. I go, that's right, it's my money. I remember in those moments, $20. And I'd spend it all on Monday and then the rest of the week. And I didn't have any Mountain Dew in my refrigerator, in my room, right? And I'd have to go down to the hallway in the dorm to the water fountain where I saw many guys wash really weird things in there. And I'd have to drink from it. Right? Oh, I remember. I remember the moment I got my, my, my uh, I ran a stop sign ran a stop sign and the cop was right there and he gave me a ticket. And I don't even remember the car full of guys. And I yelled out, no cop, no stop. <laughs> Boom. Woo. No. I remember calling the police station. How much is a stop sign ticket? 130 bucks. And I was like, $130? No. I put a jug out in front of my dorm room. Please help. Like, help me. I put the, put the speeding ticket on the side of the jug. Hoping people would walk by and give me some quarter, dollar here. 
Oh, I remember I didn't want to tell my dad, right? Don't tell my dad. Oh, man, he's going to be so mad. All he's giving me is $20, right? So like for weeks, right? So then I go over to my roommate, which is hilarious. I love my roommate back in the day. Or my next door. He's one of my favorite people on the planet, Jordan. And I go, Jordan, I need to borrow money. He said, what for? I said, pay for the speeding ticket. He's like, all right. You know what's funny about the whole story is, is that he was Jewish. I'm a Gentile. I went to him to borrow money. <laughs> Two years ago, he gave his life to Jesus. I love Jordan. He's I'll cry now because I love him so much. <laughs> Swallow the tears. I only have a minute. <laughs> All right, I did it. So I go to him to, to borrow money. And I remember him like every so often be like, hey, when are you going to give me that money? I'm like, uh, in like a couple more weeks. I only have $20 each week. If I just would have went to my father and said, hey, dad, I'm sorry. I messed up. I got a speeding. Or I got a, a stop. No one ever gets a stop sign ticket. So I keep, I keep saying speeding ticket. I did it first service too. It's a stop sign ticket. Only morons get stop sign tickets. That was me, all right? But I remember like sitting there, like punishing myself, thinking if I, if now I know, if I would have just went to my dad and said, dad, I messed up, my dad would have been like, well, that, was, that was pretty silly. You shouldn't have done that. But you know what? The money is there. Pay for the ticket. I wouldn't have had to drink out of the water fountain for like a full month. I would have actually had Mountain Dew. I would have been able to do things. I didn't go on road trips. I just sat in, sat in my dorm room in that square little box like a psycho unit doing nothing. <laughs> Bored. Guys, this is that moment you've got to recognize the promises. God has, you, you've, you've placed the threshold above you. God's in a good mood. I mean, that's something you've got you to gotta walk out of here going, you know what? God's in a good mood and he loves me. Man, you know what? I have the name above all names that when a circumstance comes, I go, Jesus. And he takes off those walls and those thresholds and those crazy barriers that you've placed and the world's placed on you. And he looks at you in the same way he looked upon Jesus. And no matter how rough it is, no matter what you're going through, you have the name of Jesus. Speak that out, Jesus. Man, it just, it, it takes care of everything. Man, Jesus is so good. I want to I wanna imagine that before Jesus came to earth, that Jesus looked upon us joyous, excited, and looks at his father and says, Dad, I want to go there and I want to pay for them. I want to give my life for them. All. That's exactly what he did. Let's pray.